So I've got uh, Brian Legalio here with Marchman Tech, also Everlast. Legalio. Legalio. Brian Legalio here. Legalio. Brian Legalio here. Legalio. Brian Legalia. That's fine. There we go. Brian Legalia here with Mars. <laughs> <laughs> I'm me. He's he. We're going to weld some bow beam. Sorry. <laughs> Bowmagicweld.com. I'm here with Brian L. <laughs> yeah. Everlast ambassador and uh, lead instructor over at Marshman Tech. Also a UA pipe fitter. And today he's going to teach me how to weld some O beam. Or what would you call this stuff? Pipe. Pipe. So obviously we're going to run some gas tungsten arc welding here. But where is this fit up and, and method primarily used? So we're going to use a similar method to what's in the power industry. Power, nuclear, coal, gas, power generation. 311 is the code we generally weld to. This will be everything that is boiler or boiler related parts. So a lot of steam? Steam, high pressure. Okay. Right here, this will be a good emulation for it, although it's schedule 40, six inch. When we do steam pipe in certain industries, nuclear being one of them, Internal reinforcement is something that they, they can ding us on. We can have excess internal reinforcement because it causes turbulence in the system. This so, is where you get something flowing through there and it creates a vibration? Vibration or, like I said, turbulence and it, it'll start spinning and wearing out pipe. Um, nuclear industry has minimal standards. So they'll go through and they will UT whole sections of pipe and they will see how thin or thick it is and see how long it can stay into service. Once it hits minwall, um, they have two options, cut it out and reweld it, or they do an overlay on it. So they try to eliminate, in the welding process, things that would let them hit minwall quicker. So they'll take a welding procedure, and they'll tell us eighth inch, and they'll say minus a 64th, or minus a 32nd. It's more stricter in the nuclear industry than it is general power, but more times than not, if you tacked up anything better than an eighth, you could be looked at on your tack up. So you're saying we want a tighter gap than what we typically see? Yes, and you, you have to be able to get some reinforcement in. Um, suck back is not acceptable. Flat would be acceptable to uh, some codes would say 332nd is the max. Um, other codes will say uh, eighth inch internal reinforcement would be max. Um, so on this one, we're going to try to achieve somewhere around um, 332 of an internal reinforcement. Um, the best way to do that is actually tighten up your fit. The, the looser the fit is, um, you'll have more internal reinforcement because you're putting more, more, more deposition. Well yeah. And if you tighten up that fit, especially on schedule 40, you can do a technique of walking the wire. And with this shrinking as you're going, because pipes hoop shrink, um, it's where this whole pipe will actually become a little bit shorter. Um, it'll give you internal reinforcement. By the time you're done, you'll have a healthy root in there. Okay. So right now we have about an eighth inch gap, zero land, 37 and a half degree bevel? Correct. Um, you clean outside, inside? Outside, inside, we're gonna be take about in, so cleanliness. It, it's necessary. Um, because this is carbon steel, this isn't stainless or anything, we don't, got, we don't have to go um, to an extraordinary level with it, but most procedures inch back. I'm going to lay my cup here. I'm going to fire with my wire. Um, I don't like to do left arc because more times than not, I run a very sharp point and I'll lose that point. And I know tungsten will make a weld way stronger than it's supposed to be, but it probably shouldn't be in there. So fire up. Get this nice and molten, introduce my rod, and then as I come up, I'm not going to go any wider than that rod unless it starts keyholing on me. Um, if I start going like this, when I'm really walking the cup, that, that's more of a technique for hot passing. Um, what that will do is that will bring the, the material I'm trying to deposit and spread it out wider and it will, it, it will cause suck back in the worst case scenario or be a flat root. We want to try to get the most uh, internal uh, reinforcement as we can, and this will up our odds in doing it, not spreading that heat and not moving that metal around. All right guys, so for this demonstration today on the route, we're gonna go ahead and run the Everlast PowerTick 210 EXT, running about 88 amps. We've got an eighth inch tungsten uh, E3 mix. Number four cup, number six, six. cup. Let's go ahead and get into some route. Fire up, get it hot, introduce my wire and start cruising. I'm looking for that puddle to spin 
as I'm coming around. If that's spinning, I'm going all the way through. I'm keeping the width of this 1 8 rod and just keep traveling. I roll off onto the bevel so I don't leave a fish eye in my route. Um, if I leave a fish eye on carbon steel, it's not the end of the world. I can usually fire up and reconsume it, but if you start doing that on duplex, ink canal, mono, um, it's usually a dead puddle where you can't reconsume it. Ask me how I know. How do you know? I thought I could reconsume it <laughs> on a test. <laughs> Didn't work out too well. No, no. Are you watching that puddle spin? Yeah. So this, at a glance, will pass most procedures because we're not gonna probably be exceeding an eighth inch of reinforcement right here. Mm -hmm. um, we're above flush on everything we've done so far. And we have all walls broke down. Right now, if I had this route done, I'd, I'd leave a, probably a four inch window on this, call over the inspector. They'd look at it and they'd, they'd pick apart every little spot on it, chip away at a little silica deposits on it, and tell me to sew it up. So when they go through this exactly, what are they looking for? They're, first thing first is they're gonna look for is all the walls are broken down. All, we don't have a sharp edge, we don't have any straight lines. Second thing is they're gonna look at reinforcement. Do we have internal reinforcement or are we sucked back? Next thing is fish eyes, internal undercuts. Internal undercuts are less susceptible on a uh, TIG process. Mm -hmm. It's more susceptible on a 6010 route, in my opinion, my humble opinion. Most of the time they'll sit here and they'll, they'll take a glance at it. Again, we'll have a window open, this being a whole section of pipe. They're tough because once they sign off, they're physically seeing that, that route and they're signing off in the documentation saying that they saw a good route. Except for the last four inches, obviously, because right. once it's sealed up, you gotta go to x-ray and, or... And they, uh, they notate where that is in the package. Okay. Of where the window was left. Bigger pipe, they lo we leave a, two windows generally. Um, so they can run one, a light on one side and look on the other. If you have something that you're trying to hide, you make that window a little bit tighter. <laughs> but generally speaking, you give them a window so you, they can see what's going on. And, you know, inspectors, they're doing their job and they might see something that you missed. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not there to bust your uh, chops, but they do sometimes. Um, especially when ironworkers become CWS. Right. When, you, when you're talking about a fish eye, for those that don't know exactly what is a fish eye, why is it bad, and how do we prevent it? So fish eyes are from when you're snapping out of a liquid puddle and you're instantly freezing the puddle without letting it taper off. So the best way to do it um, on pipe in a scratch dart rig or something that you don't have adjustment or a downslope is to walk out on the, onto the bevel. So you, you'll take your arc and you'll, your fluid puddle and you walk up and out and you'll pop. And <clears throat> fisheye is just where it, it instantly freezes and you're doing a full penetration weld. Uh, it happens a lot on aluminum, mm -hmm. um, happens a lot on full penetration, uh, carbon weld, stainless. Stainless will do it pretty easily too. So that's what I left in there for you. That's all right. Is this a handrail for the big job? Yeah, it's a handrail for the big guys. <laughs> So you said you have another uh, another technique as yeah. well that you'll, you'll do on this. We can, uh, we can drop down wires, okay. 330 second wire, and then we can feed that root. We can have the benefits of dropping down the wire of back feeding, but none of the uh, downfalls of opening up to a 316th gap. Okay. And we can, we can make that, that root heavier or lighter, depending on adding- and The amount of filler metal we're putting in there. Yeah, correct. Right. See that little bit of movement? Mm -hmm. If I'm gonna put wire on the inside of a pipe, I want to be able to, just a little bit. Just personal preference. And when I'm going to fire up, this is going to be a little wider. Fire up, I'm going to hold this side, bridge it over, and as I'm in that groove, I'm going to be pushing that wire side to side, slightly internally in the bevel. This is a 332, so I'm going to have to feed it a little bit. And you're Th keeping your filler metal pretty much vertical again, or are you leaning it back a little uh, bit Vertical, again, for a little bit of controllability. Um, that lean back is so I can have internal reinforcement on walking the wire it helps put a little bit more in. I don't have that problem with this technique because I'm feeding in internally into the pipe. Mm -hmm. 
as I'm going across here, I'm, I'm, I'm moving about 10% more side to side to grab this, this edge so I don't just fall in. Mm -hmm. um, it gives me a little buffer zone because it has a little chilling factor. As you're going through and you're feeding wire, you can grab that higher up on the bevel and it won't drop in on you. Um, but that whole time, I'm feeding that rod in. Okay. You wanna give that guy a whirl? Yeah, I give that a shot. Get that wire on the inside of that bevel a little bit, not on the outside. And let it follow your arc a little bit. You can lean it a little bit. That one there, uh, I'm not a big fan of that method. It, uh, the first one was a little bit easier to grasp. Mm-hmm. Yep. But um, wasn't that, too bad. Got some good reinforcement in there. The weld doesn't look horrible. You can cover it up with a little hot pass. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that's not something we start people out on. And that's something you work your way on. The, the original method is kind of where we start people. Mm -hmm. But it is a proven method through the years. Um, there's nothing wrong with it. The other method, it's, you know, there's more uh, mechanics. There's more hand-eye coordination. One hand's doing one thing, the other hand's doing it, another thing. And you just got to build up that muscle memory. Most things we do is just building muscle memory. Right. But, you know, you can always go back to your ironworker buddies and brag about how you welded some pipe. That's true. That's true. You have to whip out the old Rolodex. Rolodex? Well, they're older, most of the... I told you you're older. I yeah. don't... I've heard of Rolodex. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, hopefully uh, you were able to learn something throughout the video. I know what I was. I learned uh, quite a bit on this. We appreciate you guys watching the videos. Make sure to hit the like and subscribe button if you haven't done so already. And until next time, make every weld better than ironworkers. At least better than this one. Take care, guys.